Hello and welcome to the First Church of Permaculture, where today we'll be celebrating something that should be sacred to everyone, water. There's an old man called the Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? Oh, the man river, that old man river, he must know something. But don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. He don't plant taters, he don't plant cotton, and them that plants them are so forgotten. But old man river, he just keeps rolling along. You and we sweat and strain, body all aching and wrecked with pain. Tote that barge, lift that bale, get a little drunk and you'll land in jail. I get weary and sick. A trying, I'm tired of living and scared of dying. But hold the bond river, it just keeps rolling. Oh, That's a song in honor of the man who made it famous, Paul Robeson, the great singer and activist who is famous as both a social justice activist and as an environmental activist as well, reminding us that these two things go together as an environmental justice issue. As we know from looking at Native Americans and their struggle for safe water against oil companies, and in the people of Flint and their struggle for safe water as well. And when we honor water and value it and hold it sacred, then that gives people the right to clean safe water wherever they're at. And if we want to treat water as sacred and truly protect it, then we need to recognize the sovereignty of people in their communities and in their nations and their right with it, their right to control their water supply and have water sovereignty and have their own right to safe and clean water wherever they're at. So thank you for joining us today as we discuss this most important topic of water and its inherent sacredness because life, of course, is water. One more time, welcome everybody to this First Church of Permaculture. Today, while we talk about sacred water. Now, with that said, does anyone uh, feel like they have anything about this, uh, this uh, topic of water today that you would like to bring into 
our discussion before we get started or as we get started, or if you know any good water poetry that's short to share or have any thoughts about it, please feel welcome to do so. I think this mug here, which features, uh, which is handmade, um, fair trade art, artisan uh, mug here, is um, has beautiful water-like colors for the day as well. <laughs> any other news or anything that you want to bring into our discussions before we get started? Uh, and Dawn says, heck yeah, Paul Robeson. And there's a delicious tomato variety uh, named in his honor as well, which is uh, is uh, <laughs> a great tomato too. So it's it's fitting and uh, yeah, a, a great and uh, under recognized uh, activist. Um, and of course, uh, as some of you may or may not know, um, even though he did great work in his lifetime and traveled the world. Uh, singing for people and building cultural connections and, uh, and fighting for, for justice and for recognition of conditions of African-Americans in, in the United States in particular. Um, he, he was actually blackballed by, uh, by McCarthy and uh, a victim of the McCarthy era. So um, it's, uh, it, it's important to know that those doing that kind of work have not always been appreciated or recognized. And maybe that's true today of a lot of our water protectors. Okay, well, let's jump right in here. I have a slideshow for you today that we'll be using. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone can access this here. Give me just a second. Okay. And let's drop that in the chat. Later on towards the end of our service today, I'll make sure that uh, we have some time for everybody to check in as well and say hello and have a little bit more conversation. And we'll do some of that as we go through, uh, through, through uh, this material today too. Okay, so there is the uh, presentation. Well, let's open that up, take a look at what we got in there. Here we go. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, this is art by, uh, or well, it's it's actually kind of my own uh, my own painting over uh, a collage of a Nikolai Rorich piece who did beautiful um, uh, sacred feeling art. Um, he was a Russian artist and one of my favorites for the, the beauty of the natural landscapes he painted. And he did a lot of pieces that portrayed um, the, the sort of sacredness of water as well. So today we'll talk about water-wise design and uh, how we can treat water as sacred in our landscapes with the uh, Landscape Transformation Program one of our criteria for our ethical obligations to our landscapes is to try to steward water well, which means trying to catch and infiltrate and clean and appreciate every drop of water that falls on our properties, at least as much as we can. It's not always feasible to get 100%, but we can always try to do well and appreciate that water and the landscapes we manage. So we'll be seeing that today. Um, well, I mentioned Paul Robeson and talking about water and uh, uh, the connection to social justice. Uh, here's a, a, a great little um, uh, uh, book that I uh, have uh, checked out and, uh, and, and love and love the art here um, by uh, two native women. And um, just again, pointing out that, that in recognizing indigenous rights and the rights of communities of people everywhere where they live, to being able to 
have safe water is um, is 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 really the path to to having safe water. <laughs> and you know, it's not. Uh, it, it's uh, all marginalized peoples too. This isn't a matter of environmental justice. When we talk about uh, indigenous water rights in the United States, of course, that's a huge deal because of uh, of, of pipelines and and mining and uh, all of the issues that are affecting the quality of, uh, of the water that indigenous people in the United States and native people in the United States rely upon. But uh, we could also talk about Flint, a situation uh, where a primarily a predominantly African-American community uh, has not had safe water now for years. And even in the most developed uh, supposedly most advanced nation in the world, thus we can we consider ourselves in the United States, we have people uh, because of their marginalized identities who do not have access to the basic human right of water. So we could maybe start today with this uh, uh, piece of an Iroquois Thanksgiving address. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. And of course, just another quote here to recognize this ongoing battle. Water is sacred because it gives life to everything. And without water, there is no life. So as we realize today that uh, we're moving into a world where um, we're hearing pundits on TV say, that water is the new oil and that water may become one of the most vital resources in the world today. And we're seeing uh, poisoned water in places like Flint and elsewhere in North America. And we're seeing uh, the decline by many of the aquifers that support our food systems. It's important to recognize that this work to steward water is one of the most important things we can engage in today. And luckily, this is something that we can all take action on right in our own landscapes, or at least that's the idea of permaculture. As one of my other heroes, Jeff Lawton, says, all the world's problems can be solved in a garden, which, of course, also would mean these problems of water. Now, that sounds like a lovely uh, kind of hippie ideal to say. <laughs> <laughs> but is it actually true? Can we actually uh, solve this problem in our landscapes? Well, let's take a look. Um, are any of you familiar with this place? Anybody, uh, anybody seen any videos about this? Does this look like a kind of place that you'd like to visit on vacation? <laughs> By the way, I, I did mute everybody, so if you have anything to say, you'll have to unmute yourself, but then feel free to chime in. So this place, the Lost Plateau, is um, in China, and it's kind of been famous as one of, uh, of the an area that's absolutely plagued with poverty and with other uh, societal issues. Uh, it's noted, of course, as a problem for climate change because this landscape sequesters no carbon. Of course, there are no resources here. So the people who live here are, uh, you know, uh, live in a situation of deep poverty. Natural disasters are abundant here. What happens when it rains in a landscape like this? All of the water flows out and creates flooding issues. None of it soaks into the soil. It takes erosion with this. In fact, it's so bad that you can, that this landscape gives the Yellow River its name, China's Sorrow, because these silt maps float out onto the water so thick that you can actually walk on the water. Uh, and of course, that causes flooding uh, elsewhere along the, the, the river as that silt 
eventually settles. So, um, of course, class discrimination, people from this landscape are associated with the poverty here. And of course, that has a social stigma as well. They have uh, low food access, poor health and nutrition, disruption in, of families and communities as everyone leaves this landscape. Uh, and of course, poor academic achievement. Virtually every sort of social problem that we could have, they have in this area. And this has confounded some of the scientists and engineers in China for literally centuries, because this is a matter of civic pride, because this place is considered the birthplace of the Han people. And, and so it's really important to know that this was once China's breadbasket. This was once a lush, verdant paradise filled with food that supported the growth of the original Chinese civilization. What we're looking at here is not a natural desert. It's a man-made disaster. The landscape that you're looking at here was caused by agriculture, by tilling, and by poor, um, by poor grazing practices that destroyed the landscape and cause this. We cause this. And by the way, this is a universal problem. We are doing the same thing in the breadbasket of North America, but at a faster rate than has ever been observed in the history of the world. What you're looking at right here, what you're looking at here is the future of North America if we don't stop what we're doing and change what we're doing. So this problem has been eluding us and what to do about it until we changed the whole perspective and decided to change the problem holistically by recognizing that it is water that gives life and by valuing and catching and say and, and holding that let that water sacred. So what do we do? First we taught people by the way there's an excellent uh, 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 short documentary I was just about to get the, and I have the link for this as well, too. We'll share this link. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I highly recommend this, this video. I'll get you the link in a second. It's just uh, really inspiring. So what did we do? We set out and looked at some, we taught the people there. This was a, we got the people involved doing it. The people who live in the Lost Plateau transformed their own landscapes. This wasn't people from the outside sweeping in to save them. But what they did was start by, by, by learning that every mountain needs a good hat. <laughs> and by that, they meant it needs forest on the top to protect it, to catch water, and to create the fertility flows that would then flow down the sides of the hills. Next, every good mountain needs a good belt to hold its trousers up. <laughs> and by that, they established terraces to catch the water, slow it down, spread it out, and soak it into the landscape. And finally, every landscape, every, every mountain and hill needs a good pair of boots. And by that, they meant wetland to catch that water, to cycle out any final debris from it, uh, to clean it before it passes on, and then to, to build fertility that would then cycle back up the mountain, creating a system of regeneration of fertility and water that grows in wealth and abundance over time. And just a few years later, this is what that same landscape looked like. This was actually just three years uh, after the establishment of some of these projects began. And already you can see this is a landscape transformed. And 10 years later, it looked like this. Now, does this look like someplace you want to go to on vacation? <laughs> and the thing about this is, in just 10 years, all of those intractable social problems we were talking about, the poverty began to, to stabilize as this landscape provided much better farming careers for people and much more uh, productive um, a pasture area and areas to farm much better vegetables that obviously change food security entirely, improve nutrition, improve grades. Kids who are fed better 
get better grades, go figure. And it stabilized families. Instead of people, all the young people leaving here because there's no prospect for a future, young people are actually returning to this area, seeing that there's a future for it. The economy is growing as people are coming here to learn about how to transform their landscapes. And it's providing the people here with this agro-ecosystem tourism to build their economy. Again, here's another kind of before and after within just a few years of the same area. And I'd just like to open this up for a second to see if anyone has comments or more questions or more thoughts about this true landscape transformation that started with valuing water and how when we value water, the thing that gives us life, it also transforms the society that we live in as well. Does anyone have any comments or thoughts to add to this? I will grab that link in a minute. We're gonna keep going for a second. And I, I wanna point out, here's another one. If you wanna get really inspired by this kind of transformation that's happening around the world, you can Google this, um, a set of videos by permaculture teacher, Andrew Millison. And uh, these are great uh, projects to this time in India, in places where people again, live in uh, situations of true poverty. And because of historic oppression and poverty, what happens all over the world, people who are wealthier go to the best land, the land that, uh, that naturally has fertility and good access to water. What makes good land in most cases? Usually it's that the natural landscape is shaped in such a way that it naturally harvests water. Water is abundant there in the landscapes and so fertility can be abundant and it's easier to grow food and, and nutrients accumulate in the soils instead of being washed away. And we can change this social problem right at this base level of valuing water. And again, the project before and after shots are just amazing as we take areas that used to be desert and barely farmable and turn them into lush, abundant paradises for people. And we can of course uh, do this in really surprising places. Uh, Jeff Lawton himself has an incredibly inspiring video. You can Google greening the desert and see a few videos on this. The lowest place in the, on, uh, on earth, the Jordan Valley. Uh, it's amazing to see this. People thought you literally cannot grow plants here. <laughs> it's a desert. The soil is extremely salinated from bad human agriculture techniques. They use these kinds of techniques and they can grow food and food forests in the desert. And we can do this here in North America too. Uh, here's a little view of, of a, a place in Tucson. Again, this is another place that wasn't always historically like this we know. We know that at one point, these landscapes at least supported much more in the way of wildlife and, uh, and fertility for people. And uh, this is the same landscape just a few years later, thanks to the work of Brad Lancaster. And this little forest garden area, which, I mean, where would you rather live? Would you rather this be your street corner or would you rather live here? <laughs> this climate, this uh, landscape actually fights climate change too. It prevents the uh, urban heat island effect. It helps sequester carbon. It's just a bucket full of winds. And he did this largely by harvesting water through these curb cuts that allowed water back into the landscape. Meanwhile, where was this water going? We were treating it as a waste problem and flushing it down into the stormwater system. Where in an area like this, you see all that litter on the street there? That pollutes the stormwater system, the, the sand and the soil eroding pollute that stormwater system. And guess what? We have to pay for that with our tax dollars. 
<laughs> oh, this is a pro this is a solution here that not only is great for wildlife and great for people, it saves us tax dollars too. Even the tax uh, the tax conscious conservatives should be applauding this as a solution. <laughs> you know, these are bipartisan solutions as far as I'm concerned. And we can do this in our own landscapes. Here was mine. A few years ago, it's an aerial shot taken in about April in Michigan and at a time when it should be green and lush and beautiful. Of course, this was an urban site with, uh, with compacted urban soil and decades of erosion. And it got to be April already in the first dry week we had. It was completely dead, dry lawn. Everything was dead <laughs> because all the water was just pouring off just like in uh, Brad Lancaster site and polluting the stormwater system. And uh, honestly, you know, where it ended up is in flooding the, the neighborhood downhill from it, which was the historically black neighborhood, right? All across, we talk about water as a justice issue again, all across North American cities in the North, Northern post-industrial cities, we have this exact same design. Uh, where do low-income people gravitate to? The places where <laughs> rich people don't want to live. And that tends to be places that flood if you're in a city. So all across North American cities, all of our African-American neighborhoods, historically African-American neighborhoods, are rigged so that the uh, water from the stormwater system, from white neighborhoods, the stormwater systems are all set up so that they basically pump the water from white neighborhoods into black neighborhoods. <laughs> I, I mean, I laugh because what else you, do you do here? This is not really a funny thing, but it's the way we have things set up. So when we take personal responsibility over these water systems, it's a social justice issue too. So in just a few years of using very similar water harvesting techniques, that landscape looked like this. And by three years, I believe, I think this is three or four years, it looked like this. This is a garden that required almost no irrigation, almost no watering, except when I was watering in seedlings occasionally. Almost, uh, thank you for sharing that uh, to Brad Lancaster. Almost uh, uh, this garden, even with two months of drought, required no uh, specific watering of the major plants because it was set up to harvest its own water and be very water wise. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'd like to say too that Southwest Michigan where this was at was right at the 30 inches line. So it's one of the driest climates that we have in the Eastern half of the United States. So if you live East of the Mississippi, this area was one of the driest places that we have. And it's possible there to grow a lush, abundant garden without irrigating if we set up the system right and do it well. And this is a garden, uh, you can kind of see the way some of these, uh, these uh, gardens are set up here, where we have lush, abundant food gardens with, you can see the little swale-like paths and infiltration basins running in between them. It's basically like making a big rain garden that grows food. And with no water and just a few hours of work per week, it grew more than a complete diet for the, the people who lived on the site. So it's a pretty good outcome. If we design these things well, they can do really great. And by the way, this is uh, just a little idea of one kind of daily sort of yield from that garden. And here's another one a little later in the season. It produced tons of food every day all season long without any kind of irrigation system. So um, let's take a look at this chat here. Oh, thank you, yeah, for sharing that video from, uh, from Brad Lancaster. Lancaster. Um, great work. Every place that permaculturists are doing this kind of work, it's to me really exciting to see. Anyone have any thoughts, comments? Um, oh, uh, curious about how many people. Um, well, the house often had, well, the house primarily um, two people 
Uh, but the house often had more people living there too, who were also fed to some extent by the system. The system was set up mathematically to be able to feed four people, which was, um, you know, and uh, so that was kind of four people on paper uh, could be fed entirely from, from the garden. And I've, I've written quite a lot about what that system looked like to be able to get that. Now I say on paper, because in reality, I sold a lot of the produce instead so that we would, you know, so do things like go out to the, to the restaurant and uh, buy things like rice that I did not grow and uh, buy some of the things like that too. So the garden was never set up like an experiment to be 100%. It was never like, um, uh, it just wasn't realistic in my life. I thought about doing it because we grew way more food than was necessary. But I thought about, uh, you know, if I wanted to be a YouTube celebrity, I'd take a year and and uh, show that I could grow 100, literally 100% 100 of my food for, through the season. Uh, but just, uh, uh, that would be kind of like, um, I like to go out with people. <laughs> I don't want to be a YouTube celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't do that. No, I, I, I really don't have a, a desire to be a YouTube celebrity either. So, yeah, which no is why, yeah. So, oh, um, that's good to know, though. Thank you. It, you can do that. I think that's a good benchmark. Someone who wants to create a self resilient garden can create enough food for a family on maybe a third of an acre if you've got full sun and good water systems and decent soil. You know, it may require a bit more than that otherwise, but it takes a lot less than a lot of people think. One quarter to one third of an acre is actually very realistic. It's gonna give a little space in case anybody else has thoughts or comments, questions. Looking through in case I see any hands here. All right. So how, oh, I also like to point out too, these same techniques that are good for water, are often great for soil. Um, here's a before and after picture of some of the soil from that garden we were just looking at. This was taken just a few, I think five years in, five or six years in, to be honest. And here's the thing, the soil on the left, I, I will put it this way. I will say one of these two soils, uh, this is a pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> One of these two soils received about two inches of compost added every single year for about six years. The other soil never received any compost. Which side, which side is which? Of course, it's a trick question. The soil on the left is the soil that received um compost every single year and it was dug into that soil the soil on the right never received any kind of compost it was just the natural soil it started looking exactly like the soil on the left and six years later it looked like it does on the right and the way this happened was not through additions of compost or fertilizer of any kind it was through setting it up to harvest water keeping perennial plants in it all the time keeping deep mulch on it all the time, never digging, and having a lot of polyculture. These are techniques that are proven to provide all of the fertility we need in most cases and build amazing soil carbon and soil structure. So even without adding any kind of fertility, we could create systems that are abundantly fertile in most cases and have this beautiful chocolate cake crummy kind of texture. <laughs> but the same afternoon, Paul Robeson had been to the miners. Accompanied by the area agent, colliery manager and union officials, he kept a dinner date in the canteen at Woolmert Colliery on the outskirts of Edinburgh. When you see a miner and a film star together, the husky one's the miner. Well, usually. And before he went away, of course, they asked him to sing. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. In 
Salt Lake City, Joe says I am standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I ain't dead, says Joe, but I ain't dead. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes, says Joe, what they can never kill went on to organize. Went on to organize. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. So how do we do all this? What are the things that we do to create this kind of soil here? Uh, this is uh, time for us to kind of chat a little bit and make a list. What things do you do in your landscapes to harvest and catch water in the landscape? I'd like to hear your ideas. What do you got? I have a rain barrel. Oh. Yeah, I have a rain barrel too, and I have a lot of mulch, and then I do have a few hugo culture beds as well. Um, but I was going to mention that I've just been noticing recently, I do have the rain barrel that comes off of my regular asphalt shingles, and my tomatoes are starting to look kind of weird and wilty curled leaves. And so I've been wondering if maybe I shouldn't be using quite so much of the rain barrel water from the shingles on tomato. Everything else looks fine that I've been watering with it, but not the tomatoes. And they're pretty um, sheltered, so I don't think it's drift. I mean, I live in a pretty agricultural area, but nothing else seems to be affected. So I'm not sure about that. In interesting. Does it sit in a, a rain barrel at all? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, you know, it, it, it's um, the, there's a positive, rain barrels are made, generally speaking, of one of our safest plastics. So I talk a lot about gardening without plastics, poisons, and petroleum, right? And uh, what I like to say is that rain barrel, as you, you can't be perfect about it. You, we just can't expect perfection these days because plastic is ubiquitous. It's really hard to, to, um, to, to have a 100% plastic regard. So my suggestion is to work towards reducing our contact with plastics because we're seeing lots of evidence that microplastics and especially the, the, the forever chemicals like phthalates that are in the plastics are migrating into our food at what appear to be dangerous levels. There are levels over what are considered the safe levels for human consumption by most countries. And that's largely coming not from plastic packaging, but from agricultural plastics used in production. So it's definitely something to be concerned about. And we should all be trying to limit and reduce our exposure to those plastics because they bioaccumulate. And the more you get of them, the more potentially bad they are. So we can't be perfect, but we can reduce our, our problems. And rain barrels are right on the bottom of the list of the last things you'd want to reduce. So if you're, if you're trying to build a, a low plastics uh, food system, get rid of everything else before you think about replacing your rain barrel. Rain barrels are generally speaking, some of our safest. Now, hoses that hook up to the rain barrels may be a different question and they're probably right on the top of the list. 
<laughs> so, but these days we can buy hoses that say phthalates free. They usually cost about three times as much. Uh, and they also will have less uh, risk of microplastics contamination. I strongly recommend uh, getting one of these new hoses that's a phthalates free hose as soon as you can afford to do so. Uh, that's a great investment. And they tend to last longer as well. So, uh, but the rain barrel itself, I just like to say those are, are pretty safe. Uh, sorry, I had to go on a big long uh, 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 tirade there on, on rain barrels and plastics. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting back to that question then. So, and also the asphalt from the roof or, or pollution on the roof, it's highly unlikely that that is the cause of the damage of the wilt to the tomatoes. It's more likely if you are overwatering tomatoes, tomatoes can be very uh, sensitive to overwatering. Um, I recommend watering tomatoes no more than once a week. And remember the magic number for water, and we'll talk about this more next time, is one inch uh, per week of water. And that's it. If you're doing more than that, uh, unless it's really hot, if it's like 90 degrees, but tomatoes are very heat resistant. So don't overwater the tomatoes. Um, Otherwise, it could be a disease or some kind of a pest issue that's starting to, to, to affect the tomatoes as well. Uh, but it's probably not that water, okay? And just giving a space for follow-up on that gives you have more to talk about about it. I have a lot of big trees. I think they're good for this, right? Trees. And I have... Um, strips of shrubs, shrubberies, like shelter belts, you know, vegetation. There you go. I see, yeah. Denise, you've mentioned that you have kiddie pools. I'm wondering what you're doing with kiddie pools. Um, so <clears throat> That was my um, lazy, low-cost way to start getting into more proactively capturing water, um, especially during the rainy season at the end of last year is, um, I think, when I started to get the idea like, okay, I can't, I don't feel that I can put up a rain barrel right now, but what can I do? And I have to credit, you know, these um, classes with Mike for even I'm sure I, you know, came across that somewhere. And then um, at the end of last year, before, you know, things started to freeze, I actually bottled up as many, you know, bottles as I had around like milk cartons, uh, well, water jugs. And then I stored them inside. Um, my intent was to use them to water house plants, but I never kind of got around to that. So then in the spring, as I was like, getting, you know, the new season started, I relied on those as I was um, planting in new things. So I would just grab a bottle of rainwater from last year and put it in a, you know, a watering can or something. Okay. Yeah, I, I absolutely love those, uh, those little kiddie pools for, for things like this. They're also a uh, rigid plastic and uh, they're, they're considered kid safe. Um, they, they, they do probably um, uh, uh, shed some um, uh, phthalates, but very low. They probably have very low plastic as a, a fairly rigid plastic. They're, 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 they're again, they'd be at the bottom of my list of things to get away or uh, to get rid of. And you just let them fill up with water when it rains? Yeah, in fact, I was thinking of going out um, this morning or today because we actually had a pretty good rain the other day. And um, <clears throat> my neighbors were concerned about standing water and mosquitoes. So after I talked with another permaculturist, I conceded to buy some of that stuff that you can add in to the water to prevent like the larvae from hatching. So yeah, I just like let it fill up and then if I feel I want to do something with it like the other day I saw a bird perched on the edge and it was kind of low so I actually added some water from the hose just to bring the level up and scooped out a whole bunch of leaves um yeah but I 
it's kind of like a, a low priority, but it can like it can add to the overall what I do, you know, depending on how much time I have to put into it. I just love any kind of techniques that are super flexible like that. And uh, <laughs> and they're there. And if you got time, you can do some something with them. That's, you know, that's my kind of permaculture. Also, I'll, I'll weigh on in on those are called mosquito dunks usually or mosquito donuts. They sell those mm -hmm. things. They're mostly they're they're mostly herbal a lot of them and they they're effective and they probably don't affect anything else other than mosquitoes much so if you're i went to add them to a landscape where you're trying to um, have fish or other aquatic life mammals or anything or, or amphibians because um, they rely on the mosquito larvae as food but in a situation like this where you're you're primarily using it to water or maybe grow some plants they're perfectly okay to throw in there. I, I agree with that too. Hmm. Those are going to go on sale soon, you know. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, here we got um, uh, mulch, kugel cultures, um, trees. We're going to talk about those. Uh, trees are actually my single favorite water harvesting device. We'll probably talk about those a little bit today. Uh, any other things that you, you've, you've done in your gardens that, uh, that we didn't get on here on our list yet? Oh, nurse logs. Oh, <laughs> trees in the other form. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we can say, hello, nurse. Hello, nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Swales. All right. Well, this is a great list to start with. Uh, any last things you want to add? Otherwise, we're going to move on. And I, I have uh, my own list here. Uh, here. <laughs> if I can make this go, go. All right, here we go. This is literally all of the ways that I am aware of for harvesting or for creating water harvesting features in the landscape. Um, so, uh, so there might be some subtypes of some of these things, but this, and we can talk about those too, but these are the major headings, all of the ways we can harvest water in the landscape. And well, before we finish up today, I'd like to talk about some of these so we can see them all. And, um, and you know, just to get the idea of, uh, the, the most basic idea here is you're basically making a kiddie pool in the ground. <laughs> all of our forms of water harvesting are basically, you're digging a hole of some kind so that water can go in there. And infiltration basins, are, are basically like rain gardens. Rain gardens are one to, are actually one type of infiltration basin. And uh, another type is the famous banana circle. What you're looking at here is called a banana circle. And a banana circle is building an infiltration basin, a dug out pit, and then usually linking that up with water some, somehow from the house. So it's a, in fact, the garden that I'm sitting by right here is going to have water set up so that in the, the summer months when it's possible, all the water that's going out the kitchen sink, which is right here by this wall next to me, is going to go out right into the garden uh, that's right here. And this is going to be a really easy system. I don't know, hope you can see that. Um, and this is going to be a really easy system to set up. That's going to be one of the main ways this little zone one garden gets some of its water. As it is right now, even things like coffee are going in here too. So it's going to have a little bit of, uh, of a, um, a system like this, but it's going to be basically like this, a big infiltration base. And it's going to get water from, excuse me, inside the house from whenever we're uh, washing dishes. Of course, that means we have to use safe dishwashing detergent that will be good in the garden too. And there's some other ways we can, can make sure that that water is going to be a problem. Uh, yes, Andy. 
So everything you put down the kitchen sink will go out into the garden. Yes, it's going to have to, and we're, we'll talk about how to do this well in some of the next classes, because it's going to have some food and de debris and things like this uh -huh. too, which means it's also going to have a lot of fertility potential, um, which can be both good and bad. So we have to have a system that is able to compost that and make use of that fertility when it ends up in, in the garden. In a, a banana circle type system like this, what you also see is basically a woody compost pile built in the middle of this banana circle so that the, uh, the fungi and the microbes in that mulch pit there will break down the, uh, any of those materials, make sure that they're safe and turn them into fertility for the garden. So not only does this kind of system basically water the garden, it also is the primary way that this kind of a garden is fertilized as well. These are great kinds of systems uh, to use. And, and what's growing there, well, I mean, I'm not that familiar with growing bananas because I live in Indiana, obviously, but what's growing there, is it supposed to be like a perennials or is it like that mixed garden you just showed or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. A, a, a temperate climate design for this or a more universal design. Mm -hmm. And this is found in uh, the book, Beauty and Abundance. It's a it's a, a design that I recommend all the time for people in small spaces and uh, people who live on flat land. A lot of us, you know, people see these pictures of permaculture swales, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and they get super inspired and they're like, oh man, I wish I lived on a big slope so that I could uh, do one of these projects like, uh, like in the Lost Plateau we were seeing. The truth is, it's easier to harvest rainwater if you're on flat land. So, uh, and, and this is one of those things that people see, they'll see those projects and they'll go, oh man, I, I wish that I had a slope just so I could do swales. But the truth is, this is way better. And this is a, a kind of design that we can use in any place. So this kind of design uses a mulch basin in the middle, which is filled with deep mulch again. And then it's, as it says here in blue on the left, a swale path collects water from a downspout so that the water, and I, I'll show you more pictures about how to set this up. In fact, here's one. Here on the bottom right, you can see how there's a downspout that in the summer has a rain barrel. Uh, in uh, the rest of the year, the rain barrel goes away and the water flows through this infiltration trench here, and, mm -hmm. which actually helps clean it. All of the, uh, someone mentioned um, pollution from the roof. Mm -hmm. This is a system that cleans out and filters that roof pollution before it gets to the garden. And it doesn't take a lot of time to install a system like this. So this trench brings that, um, brings that water into this infiltration basin to make an annual garden bed makeover that requires almost no water. Uh, as you can see from my own gardening experience, this is the way those gardens were set up. And it requires very little in the way of fertilizer because a lot of the fertilizer too is being pumped in, into this kind of system too. It's, it's a great design. And here it's surrounded on the edges by those fortress plants we talked about so that grasses and weeds can't encroach on it. And then in the middle of the bed, it has deep mulch. So we can just put in annual starts right into that garden. That's the way my garden out here I just showed you was. And you're done. You know, a garden like this requires almost no watering, almost no fertilizer, almost no weeding because it has the weeding designed right into it. It's the easiest possible garden design you could ever create. And I'm sorry to keep asking questions, but this is sort of like a keyhole garden to me because it's got an opening with a thing in the center. Is this just flat on the ground? Um, it, it would look like this. If uh -huh. you look. So yes, basically it's got like a hole in a tiny little trench around it, and then a little mountain around the outside, a tiny mountain. That's, that is exactly it. And then, uh, and then the tiny mountain um, is basically covered over uh, and all this in the middle here is all covered over with lots of deep mulch. 
um, mm -hmm. so that so that all you have to do to maintain this garden is plant in your annual plants and it is just done. Um, let's see, I have a question here about fortress plants. Uh, yes, we have, uh, Beauty and Abundance has a few lists of fortress plants and lots of guilds that show lots of fortress plantings. Um, so there are some in there. And in August, our topic, our, our first Church of Permaculture topic for August will be polyculture design and guild design. And we'll have, uh, I'm going to do the biggest, most advanced workshop on polyculture design that I've ever done. <laughs> it's going to, I think, be a four or five day uh, separate class in addition to the two free First Church of Permaculture classes. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to go deep into not, not only my own list, but how to use some, to, some ecological science, uh, like what's called Grimes theories, to figure out in different contexts what kind of plants would be great fortress plants. And we're going to, to like, I think I have literally never seen anyone else go into this into the depth on the science of succession and grime strategies. Those are the two big things, grime strategies and, uh, and successional strategies and niches on how to design uh, polycultures and guilds. So, um, <laughs> so yes, and, and uh, uh, I think if you search the transformative adventures group, that permaculture and abundance group, and just put into the search fortress plants, you'll see a bunch of, of posts on fortress plants. They'll give you a bunch more ideas as well. <laughs> All right. Okay. So what do you do for the mulch? I agree with Denise there. Homemade mulch is the best kind of mulch. This particular guild here is also great uh, because if you read it uh, the, in the text that this is uh, published with in Beauty and Abundance, it, it has some more things, some more details. And one of the things is that a guild like this, a garden like this, will have mulch maker plants grown right in the garden, which can include comfrey. It can include fast growing woody perennials that you can chop and drop for lots of deep mulch, tall perennials things like Jerusalem artichokes and artichokes grow tons of biomass that you can chop and drop. Probably my single favorite one is Jerusalem artichoke because it produces so much mass and it produces a food product. And in North America, it's a native plant and it's a great fortress plant, which is one of the strongest allele paths to grasses that we know. So it's a great plant for repelling grasses. Um, so the best mulch is the mulch that you can grow right here in the garden. And if you've got some mown grass paths, then the grass can also make a great finish mulch that you can put on that garden as well. So yeah, the, 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 so if you want pretty mulch, what you do is you grow your chop and drop plants right in the garden at those edges. You put them to the north so they don't shade out the garden. And then you can chop and drop those to get a nice deep <laughs> layer of mulch on that garden all the time. Uh, plants like squash and tomatoes, if you're growing them in here, will produce tons of biomass. At the end of the season, they get just go right down back on the ground too. So this kind of garden has tons of mulch on it all the time. Then if you want it to be pretty, a light sprinkling of grass clippings over the top of it looks really attractive and I, I'll show I have lots of pictures I think I have pictures of that in beauty and abundance as well. Can I ask a question about the chop and drop? <laughs> so um you know I have some very tall weeds that I leave in there like evening primrose and um things of that nature and if I cut something down and I think, oh, good, that will help be mulch, but it's like this big, gigantic plant. I always think, am I supposed to chop this up into little pieces? But that sounds like too much work. Um, so if you could just speak to that. Um, well, the, I would say both. You okay. can do it either way. If you chop and drop and you want it to be um, look more like conventional mulch, then uh, I usually use my, um, 
my hand sickle, um, my comma that I showed in the in one of our last classes, I think. I don't think that was in permaculture church. I think it was in one of the classes. And just real quick, it could go wop, 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 and chop it up carefully and chop it up into smaller pieces. Or I can just chop and drop and put it all down whole and not chop it up. Things like squash plants and tomato plants at the end of the season, I'm not out there chopping them all up. The only problem with that, Denise, there's no problem with it at all, ecologically. That's what nature does, right? The only problem with it is, is maybe visually and aesthetic wise. So in that case, that's when I might chop up some to get a nice, a more even texture and then do use finish mulch on the top like those grass clippings. Then you've got the best of both worlds. You can be super lazy and not have to chop up all that mulch. <laughs> and you still get something that looks pretty and finished at the end by using a finish mulch just over the top of it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, and just to add one more thing, if we're talking about an annual garden, the best mulch is a mix of mostly herbaceous plants. Um, in this next few classes, or next month, when we talk about polyculture, we'll talk about the best mulches for different kinds of systems. If you're talking about growing trees, this is kind of weird, but if you're talking about growing trees, the best mulch is usually trees. <laughs> the best mulch are woody mulches because guess what? They're made of exactly the kind of nutrients that trees need. Kind of you are what you eat, duh. <laughs> so if you're growing trees, the best mulch is wood chip mulch or nurse logs and woody perennial stuff. If you're growing an annual garden, that can actually have some problems if you're using all wood chip mulch. It can actually kind of cause some problems. And the best mulches will actually be this mix of that chop and drop kind of stuff. So it's kind of a weird thing. Uh, the best mulch for a garden like this is the stuff that you're growing in the garden like this. <laughs> because just like we are what we eat, plants are what they eat too. Yeah, I instinctively started doing that. And like, sometimes I'd even, if I was being lazy about taking something out to the compost, I'd be like, hmm, I have some uh, blueberries that are not good. Let me put these by the blueberry plants. Good luck, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let the blueberries do that. Let the blueberries do the composting for them instead of you doing it. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I promised on Facebook was that I would show you some patterns that are great for harvesting water on flatland. And this is really um, one of the best to me. It's a great pattern in small areas. You can design whole gardens around this kind of system. And uh, here's one that Jeff Lawton, I believe, showed in one of his videos. It works the same way. It's a, a little garden like this, where this little brick path has been routed to fill up this little keyhole type garden with water from a downspout. It's just, to me, one of the best designs we have. And then you see these fertility tubes in here, which are for vermicomposting. So this system integrates water collection, which wa fills this up and then seeps into the ground and vermicompost tubes to go with it as well. Um, if we want, we can even create systems that will are like little in-ground ponds. Uh, you can research these two. They're called wicking beds or wicking worm beds, where we can actually integrate in worm tube and vermicomposting systems into something like this so that we get additional fertility from those vermicomposting systems. Uh, and we can do them above ground. This is a system that's been built in a raised bed. And, uh, and it's set up again, where water probably from a rain barrel or something goes into this system. So it's self-watering, self-fertilizing, filled with deep compost. You just can't make an easier garden than this, right? Or you can build systems like this into the ground too, 
by using infiltration basins. So pattern number two we can talk about today are these kind of wicking beds and wicking worm beds, a great way in small flat areas to harvest and catch water. Mike, I see that Aaron had a question about the bulk the, on the uh, banana thing. Does the mulch basin double as a pathway or is the bed accessed from the outside only? Uh, yeah, uh, in this kind of system or in the banana circle, that mulch basin is basically meant to be a path. Um, so, so, yeah, a absolutely. The, um, uh, it's, it's filled with deep mulch. You can also, when I make one of these, I'll tell you exactly what I do. <laughs> I usually, 90% of the bed is no dig, is no till. The only part that's tilled or dug, uh, let me see if I can grab a pen here. Is, is that blue visible? Okay. The only part that's dug is this section right here. So that the water can come from, you know, here's the downspout and the water comes along this trough and goes into this. And then this infiltration basin is dug out a ways and the water or the soil is moved to uh, the, I'm gonna use yellow for the soil pile, you know, the soil piles are basically here and kind of the down, you know, so that the, the soil is moved here. So it makes a very shallow little thing, but then the rest of it is just sheet mulch. So I'll put cardboard in here and, uh, and then deep mulch on top of that. And then the red area that I dug, this area right here, I'm gonna make it even more red so you can see what I'm talking about. This area right here is usually, I will chop and drop, put grass in there, herbaceous plants, so there's nitrogen. And then I'll top that off with a good like three or four inches of wood chips. So that infiltration basin area will always kind of be filled with wood chips. Um, what I found is that this lasts about three or four years. After three or four years, this infiltration basin, which is always wet and filled with nutrients, eventually becomes amazing soil and, it's, and it breaks down and it's necessary. So I'll chop and drop and then uh, maybe put down a layer of newspaper or cardboard again and retop it off with four inches more of wood chips. Every, I, I think it was actually about four years. Um, so every four years it gets topped off again. And so it's a path. And will this bed work on a slight slope if you have that opening to catch water coming down your small slope? Is that a uh, good idea? That's a great idea. Yay. <laughs> I have a question about, so when you're adding your herbaceous mulch each year, are you pulling back the wood chips and then putting it and then or is it once every four years only you're adding the herbaceous material? Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, clear. So when I chop and drop, this area here has been growing like my tomatoes and uh, squash and uh, maybe some corn. Um, I usually grow corn in a different kind of system, but uh, it's definitely, you know, radishes, lettuces, any kind of uh, those vegetables that I have. At the end of the year, um, those get chopped and dropped in place. So the herbaceous mulches go mostly, you know, some are going to, you know, there's going to be a little bit ends up there, right? <laughs> but most of that I'm trying to chop and drop about in place. So I end up with a really good thick layer of herbaceous mulch there. And then when I add grass clippings, the yellow is grass clippings to finish it off. So then I'll, you know, add some grass clippings here um, on top of that so that that looks really pretty. The, um, the, this part usually only gets wood chips added, except maybe the first time when I make it. When I make it, and this is probably a little bit superstitious, but I really like the idea that there's this sort of buried fertility pit to seep out and transform that soil in at the center of the garden. It kind of makes it a little bit more like a banana circle in that way. Um, but 
uh, honestly, that's probably a little bit superstitious. The system is probably filled with nutrients anyway. Uh, though the one thing I can tell you that I do uh, is that I usually inoculate these wood chip pits with, uh, with mushrooms as well, usually wine cap mushrooms. So even the path is useful space. Even the path is still a food production system. Uh, and during the times of year when it's fruiting, it's usually just like twice a year, then I have to step around the mushrooms or harvest the mushrooms to get into the bed. But that's not really too big of a, you know, if the worst problem is that to walk in your garden, you have to harvest mushrooms. It's not a big problem. What a hardship. <laughs> Did that answer the question clearly? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And I'll tell you, uh, I think this is a pattern you can use on 95% of permaculture sites. You know, almost every site with small zone one vegetable garden can use this kind of pattern. I will probably never garden again without it. My main production beds at Lily House were that way. This was the same exact design that I used at my rental space uh, the last year before I moved into this project space. And already the main beds that I have here are designed exactly this way again. To me, it's just one of the most useful kinds of designs uh, that we can create, and it has no drawbacks I know of. It's basically a rain garden that grows food. And how deep is that hole in the center? Maybe you said this and I missed it. When, um, you, when you're digging it out before you put any fertility stuff in it. Uh, it's usually just enough to remove that sod. Oh, you know, okay. how, however much sod is there. Uh, so it's usually, you know, and usually to get the sod, you're taking four to six inches. So it's about four to six inches of depth. Um, if you if you wanted to, and you had a lot of water you were trying to get into here, you could make it deeper than that. Of course, what happens when it rains? Uh, when it rains, you know, this, this the, the water is going to flow into here right? The water is mm -hmm. going to flow into here and fill this up first, right? The water is going to fill this up first. But then we take the sod and the sod has been placed around the edges, right? I should make that a different color. I should make it like green. So the sod, when I move it, has been placed around the edges. By the way, sod is magic. When you turn sod upside down and compost sod, old timey rose gardeners, old, uh, uh, high product productivity vegetable gardeners from the, uh, you know, the French intensive gardening era considered composted sod, especially composted clay sod, to be the single best garden amendment you could add to soil. It's magical stuff. So by valuing that, never take that sod and throw it away. You know, put that sod to make a little kind of mini soil area. So that middle section will, will fill up first. But then next, this area, this garden soil and mulch pit area will saturate next, right? So that's going to saturate first before finally the water kind of seeps outward to the next kind of, uh, to the next garden areas. We're not building some big swale, so it's not gonna wash that off. It's going to be pretty stable, especially if it's planted with perennial plants around the edge. And uh, so it's going to be pretty stable as a structure and it's going to saturate with the water. It's going to hold a lot of water. It's a great kind of water collection system. So does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. I love talking about this design because it's, it, it really is one of my favorite designs. And uh, by the way, this isn't my own design. This, uh, <laughs> this I've elaborated it on, on it a bit. But this is a, a classic Bill Mollison permaculture design. It's one that he described in, uh, in one of his PDCs. And, uh, and I think that because he was working generally on bigger landscapes, he gravitated towards, towards other uh, kinds of uh, uh, promoting other kinds of features like swales. But really, for most of us who are doing home scale permaculture, I think this is almost one of the most uh, uh, useful of all Bill Mollison's garden designs. Okay, so we can take that same kind of idea and apply it 
to uh, to bigger landscape. So this is the original sketch before we started implementing the garden. This was the original design sketch for the water systems at Lily House. And uh, this month, I think in the transformative adventure group, I put on the date, it's going to be the week after the next uh, First Church of Permaculture, which is always the uh, last Sunday. So the week after the last Sunday, <laughs> we've, we have uh, four water design classes coming up and we're going to walk you through in those classes if you feel like joining them. We'll walk you through designing a complete comprehensive water design for your site using all of these different kinds of systems. Um, so uh, as you can see here, you know, we have a water barrel design going to a trough that goes into little mini swales and infiltration basins. And, uh, and we can use all these different kinds of techniques together and create an amazing, uh, um, amazing water system. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're going to kind of wrap up. Aaron, thanks for, for joining. I want to get into just a few more things. But then in the next class, last Sunday, we're going to go through even more uh, water harvesting techniques. I was going to try to get through them all in this first Sunday, but I don't think we're going to quite get to them all. But we'll get to uh, just a few more. And that gives us more to go through in our next First Church of Permaculture, where we'll get into uh, uh, more of these kinds of techniques. Uh, a great one that Native Americans used a lot were waffle gardens. These were great structures because uh, they were usually made on a slight slope. And what they do is they concentrate water. So in each of these little waffles, you might have one little area right here that you're planting the plant in this corner. And that means all of this area in each waffle is harvesting water that then flows downhill to the one little area where we're trying to, to, to grow a plant. It's another really kind of brilliant design. And uh, we can also top these off with mulch inside these little basins too. These are like little mini infiltration basins and it's another just great design. And we, we even are very lucky to have some original pictures, you know, very old pictures of these in actual use. So one of the techniques that Native Americans used to grow crops in places that Europeans literally thought it was impossible to grow crops. <laughs> Europeans were looking at the landscape and going, nope, it's impossible to grow crops there. And uh, you know, and Native Americans were doing it because they saw the water and the land and <laughs> itself as sacred and they treated it that way. Okay, probably the last one we'll talk about today. One quick question is, about the waffle garden. So then for that type of a thing, would you just cut out the sod as well and just plant down into where the sod was removed? In that case, would you put the sod around the edges or would you just cut down and then put the sod somewhere else? I, I believe this technique is actually most useful in an area when you, when you literally cannot support sod. So if you are gardening in a sandbox or you're gardening in a, a true kind of desert area where there's very sparse vegetation so that you're not really talking about removing the sod so much. That is when I think this technique um, really kind of shines. Otherwise, I think it gets to be really uh, labor intensive. I am kind of opposed to ever removing the sod if you don't have to because the sod is the best soil you have and it's going to have the best soil structure and it's filled with nutrients. So it's just so much better to try to leave the sod in place if you can. Um, so it's, it's a, a very cool technique, but uh, maybe not one of our most universal uh, kind of techniques. Okay. Uh, uh, so this was often used in like the uh, Southwest in, in very arid places. Um, 
So swales are probably one of permaculture's most famous and recognizable um, uh, ideas. And swales, just to get an idea of what they look like, swales are basically ditches that are perfectly on contour. So instead of moving water, they catch the water and store it in place and soak it into the ground. So from a cross section, it looks like this. And you can see really clearly the idea is the water is going to flow down and fill up here and then soak into the ground and likely we're going to have a subsoil layer here, right? Going underneath this. And so the water is going to hit the subsoil layer and soak down, oops, I want blue for water. So that it's gonna hit that subsoil layer and soak down through the soil this way, through the soil strata and help water that tree and those crops as they get established. Swales are a pretty, cool and amazing technique, especially <clears throat> on big, broad landscapes. And uh, you can search for Jeff Lawton Swale on YouTube, and he's the Swale King. He has got the best videos on swales I've ever seen. And, um, and it can be an amazing technique where you have a slope uh, that's pretty significant, but not greater than 15%. Over a 15% grade, the swales are, are, cannot be used, but less than that, they are a great technique. Usually, swales are made with, uh, with some kind of a plow equipment or earth moving equipment so that you can dig out this soil uh, that was here and move it to here, right? So you're taking the soil from one place and then making a, swale, uh, a soil pile here so that the water will get caught and flow down through the landscape. Um, so swales are amazing. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I used to talk about them a lot and talk them up a lot. And so now, they're so recognizable and so uh, ubiquitous in permaculture that I like to, to point out that they're not always necessary and maybe not always our most useful design. There may be better ways or different ways we can do swaling. And for example, on, on if the soil is flat and you have pretty decent water infiltration, you probably don't need to have a swale. Another thing with swales, is that swales are tree establishment systems. It requires the trees and the tree roots, because trees are very strongly rooting, to prevent the swale from potentially washing out. Without the tree roots, this uh, can fill up and actually blow out that swale and wash out the swale. So swales are best considered as tree establishment systems. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about swales next time. Uh, we'll talk about that next. And we'll talk about designing swales and good ways to design swales later. Um, this, I like to point this out too. This is from Toby Hemingway's Gaia's Garden. We don't have to have one big, long, continuous swale in a landscape, right? We don't have to make one big, long trench. We can design landscapes that have little micro swales across the landscape so that they can harvest the water and soak it in next to where our trees are at. So it's a really great kind of design. So um, for example, if I want to plant a tree right here, this is my tree planting spot. There's gonna be my tree. I might just make one little micro mini swale in front of that tree to help catch the water and soak it in for this one tree. And that can be a great design. And it's something that we can do a little bit at a time with shovels instead of having to um, uh, build, get big equipment and swale a whole landscape. 
just leaving a little space in case people have thoughts or comments about this, I'm going to say we're going to get into swales much more at our next First Church of Permaculture. So I just want to show you one final swale alternative that is useful in a lot of places. And it's my well, one of my absolute favorite ways to harvest water in the landscape. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> what is that? It's very odd looking. <laughs> it is. Have you ever seen anything like this in the forest? Not in this country. Oh, not in this country. Oh, there. No, in the UK, I have. Oh, okay. You you might find them. They might be a little subtle, but any place where we have older growth forest. This is actually a very common uh, phenomenon. And I'm going to invite you to next time you go out to a forest and go for a walk in, a, in an older kind of forest that hasn't been cleaned up or anything. Oh, ficus down in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. If you go into a redwood forest, you'll see massive examples of this. Um, this is called the nurse log phenomenon. And this is an ecological phenomenon that has been observed all over the world. And it's the idea that pioneer trees will start to grow and only the hardiest trees can grow in say a, a, a young landscape, a desert landscape. But as they fall, then they host new hardier or trees that are uh, less water resistant. How these work is amazing. The fallen tree becomes a nurse for a whole new forest ecosystem. And one of the amazing things that happened here is that they tag team with fungi. So as fungi feed on this, they turn the log into a storage system for water. Fungi can actually reach out all through this area, collect water and transport it back and store it in this log. So this log becomes an amazing water storage system. And underneath it is always this amazing water reservoir. If you find even a young log in the forest and lift it up, you'll find mycelia under there. And it could be two months of drought. Everything looks dead. But next to a nurse log, underneath it, it's rich and moist soil, and it has water underneath it. What, nurse logs are one of the nature's best water harvesting systems. They're uh, quite spectacular, actually. And now we know that indigenous scientists and native peoples around the world for millennia, including in the Amazon, there's research now that shows that this technique using nurse logs is one of the ways that native people built the indigenous food forests of the Amazon. And the way they did it is using these just like swales. Bill Molson even referred to this technique as passive swaling. So the way this works is instead of making swales on contour, we can lay down nurse logs on contour um, so that what we get is on a slope, you can come in and lay down, uh, we'll make our nurse logs red. You can lay down some nurse logs and what will happen is the water flowing down the hill catches these, slows down, soaks through, and as it does, it deposits sediment over time and leaves and little plant pieces and debris, those build up here and actually form a little mini swale behind this nurse log. This soil is amazingly rich. The nurse logs are filled with nutrients. Fungi use them to create an amazing water reservoir underneath this. And this is an amazing tree establishment system. And now we have decades of research showing this system works amazingly well in all climates, Mediterranean climates. 
uh, at North American climates, wet climates, dry climates, desert climates. It's an amazing system that is proven to help establish trees amazingly well. And think about this, while a swale can often take getting out and digging and doing that extra labor, a lot of times it's really easy to just move some sticks into place so that they can protect that tree. This is one of my favorite and most universal uh, water harvesting feature systems. Just leaving a little space in case people have questions, comments, or, uh, or uh, thoughts about these. By the way, in the scientific literature on them, they're, called, they're usually called LEBs, which is log erosion barriers. So if you wanna find the research on them, you can search, up, search for LEBs. So that is, uh, and this is one of the ways that, in, uh, like I said, that indigenous people and humans have used to establish high productivity forest systems for millennia. It's a great system that we can emulate. Um, and in, uh, in the real world, it can look like this. They don't have to be perfect or like this. They want, so they can also look quite beautiful, which is nice. And they don't have to be perfect. They just have to be designed enough so that uh, you can tell the water coming down the system is going to hit a log, slow down, sink in, and build soil with it. Just leaving a little bit of space in case people have questions, comments, thoughts about those nurse log systems. I guess I'm gonna end with one last one, which is one that Sandy mentioned. Trees. <laughs> Trees happen to be our ultimate water collection device. Uh, in fact, uh, landscape engineers and scientists, when they're measuring infiltration and in landscapes of water, they use forests and trees they consider to catch nearly 100% of the water that falls on them. You can find citations and signs on that from the USDA, the American Society of Landscape Architects, and et cetera. It's just generally the engineering rule of thumb for it. Now, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to use that term. Um, it's, it's what's generally used. Um, forested areas and trees infiltrate nearly 100% of the water that fall on them. So again, hedgerows, forest gardens, these kinds of tools we can use to catch and store our water and create really brilliant, beautiful, abundant landscapes. Well, it doesn't necessarily take trees or swales or infiltration basins or a shovel to create truly powerful water harvesting features. In a lot of cases, all we need are trees uh, forests not only increase infiltration of water, but also the mobility in soils, helping to move water around in the landscape. In one study, uh, flower meadows also could do the same. So we can use ecosystems in general. More tree facts, uh, a single tree, a single oak can improve water infiltration by 2.3 to 3.4 times in a lot of cases. Many researchers have concluded that trees can be a highly effective method of stormwater control and management. And uh, even in the Pacific Northwest, in rainforest conditions, scientists have studied and found that tree systems and forests can catch and infiltrate like 100% of the water, up to 30 inches of water in a single rain event. Trees are truly amazing water catchment devices. Uh, good food forest trees for shade. Oh, um, a, a really good point. Oaks would be amazing. There are oaks that have really great uh, edible acorns as well. Chestnuts are amazing as well. I really love pecans and hickory nuts. And of course, walnuts too are all excellent shade trees that are also great edibles. All right. On that note, we've gone through a lot of our water harvesting features. We didn't get through them all. We're going to come back and do a few more 
next time. Uh, does anyone else have thoughts, comments, questions, anything you want to contribute about water harvesting techniques? Did you hear something that was interesting and useful to you? I hope I hope everyone got something new that they can use um, to, to grow better gardens. Oh, here's another illustration in here of another wicking worm bed uh, design. I love these. Just want to throw in, throw that out there because this, this slideshow has some great stuff in it. We'll get back and we'll do more next time. Any last thoughts, any questions, comments, anything that was surprising to you? Oh, great, Alicia. I'm glad you could join. Oh, I'm glad you learned stuff. <laughs> I really enjoyed the whole keyhole kind of banana bed. I mean, it's just so obvious, but yet it's something that pretty much anybody can do close to their house where it's maybe convenient. And so I, I'm definitely going to try to utilize that a little bit more. Great. I'm glad. And then, uh, you know, but double that up with those nurse logs. Boom. <laughs> there you go. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Last thought for today. I'd like to leave you with a little, uh, a little uh, Zen poem on water, just to remind us of the sacredness of water. Turning on the faucet, water flows from high in the mountains. Water flows to us from deep in the earth. Sacred water, which sustains all life comes to me at the turn of a faucet. What a miracle. Mm. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. I hope you have a wonderful week. And next time you turn on the faucet, I hope you think about what a miracle it is that we have water and this access to it. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you.